So thank you all for having me today. Uh, thanks for the presentation. It means that we can jump straight to the fun, first fun part of the presentation. That's uh, a quiz. So um, by show of hands, uh, you'll have four options now. And I'd like you to uh, raise your hand whenever, you, whatever you think is the, the right answer uh, to which method or tool is most likely used by ransomware groups during a network breach. Okay, so we have four options. Pivoting from cloud environment to internal network. PSExec by sysinternals. Microsoft Exchange zero day vulnerability. Or Mimikatz. Wait, uh, for every vote, I'd like to take a selfie with you so you can't deny that you voted the wrong one. Um, who thinks it's the first option? Yeah. Uh, who thinks it's the second one? Third one. Fourth. Um, fourth again. Okay. Um, the right answer is PS exec by sys internals. Um, and uh, this leads to, to the message of the presentation and wh wh what's the demonstration that we'll have next. And this was according to CISA's Stop Ransomware project, where they analyze different network breaches and APTs. Uh, we searched for 19 of them. And Mimikatz was among five, uh, whereas PS exec was uh, among seven of those network breaches. And uh, it's interesting, right? Because like PS exec is an administration tool from uh, more than 20 years uh, ago. This is what, when it was launched. Uh, obviously, it's still in use by, by admins, but um, still, uh, how come or why uh, so many of you had the wrong notion that it is Mimikatz. Uh, maybe it's because Mimikatz is a bit more flashy, and maybe it's because uh, we are all biased towards novelty um, more than actual risk relevance. And this is the misconception that uh, I want you to break today. Um, it's, yeah, it's something that, that happens that researchers and media outlets are incentivized towards everything that was never seen before uh, or everything uh, that, that is uh, novel or technically complex. Um, but all this, uh, these things that we see on the media are very often relevant only to a small fraction of organizations when you're trying to uh, defend a network. Um, a little bit about myself. I've been in the cybersecurity industry for around 11 years in both offensive and defensive roles, and uh, I joined Cato Networks three and a half years ago. Today, I'm a security research manager at the content group of Cato Networks. And back when I joined, uh, it was three and a half years ago, and my boss hired me and told me, hi, these are your two employees. This is your team. And now your goal is to make our security uh, the best possible. And by saying the best possible, I knew that he actually meant make us better than the competitors, of course. Um, but so, so I tried looking around at what competitors offer in terms of security and I think it changed a little bit since then, but back at those days, it was like the more CVEs that you cover in your IPS, um, the better. It was just counting CVEs. And something felt weird to me uh, about this approach, like, is it really what, what you need to do to, to count CVEs? Because I thought to myself, how would uh, uh, the next attack on one of our customers be carried out, or how would it start? Obviously, it would be by someone clicking a, a link that they shouldn't click, uh, a phishing link, right? So would it be a zero-day CVE? Probably not. It's not that these uh, need to be completely neglected, but there has to be some shift of the mindset, and that shift of the mindset, which I... Um, our team uh, has adopted is the focus on um, 
what matters and not necessarily on what's novel or flashy. And if we're looking at it by, like, everyone knows this equation, right? Uh, you can say it by heart. Uh, risk is severity times likelihood. Is, do you see novelty in this equation? No. Technical complexity? Not either. Um, so uh, this approach uh, is something that led our team to recently come up with the attempt to generate an archetype for uh, the most classic attack from start to end, um, like the, the most run-of-the-mill, uh, every Joe of the attacks, uh, something that uh, on one hand has nothing special, but on the other hand, has a lot to teach us about how attacks are carried out uh, and what are the most popular techniques that we see, um, even nowadays, even though some of them are, as you've seen, 20-year-old administration tools that are not even uh, malicious per se. To do this, uh, we uh, search across, uh, across different resources. One of them is MITRE. Um, Raise your hand, feel comfortable, it's a safe space, if you don't know what the attack matrix of MITRE is. Okay, so the uh, matrix, uh, MITRE is an organization uh, of cybersecurity, non-profit if I remember correctly, and they've come up with uh, an approach to how to analyze APTs and how they are carried out the different stages of APTs. The attack matrix is some sort of a taxonomy that goes in, we will see it later, but it goes from start to end um, from the initial access of an attacker onto the victim's network, and then how they progress in, how they privilege their escalations, move across different machines, and eventually cause some impact. Um, there's also the MITRE Ingenuity, that's a benchmark that uh, MITRE has published to uh, make security assessments. So they have a couple of example scenarios. Attack flows, that's some sort of a language that MITRE created to uh, schematically explain how specific attacks are carried out, and it's used uh, broadly now. There's also Atomic Red Team Test Suite that whereas, well, um, MITRE attack metrics is a bit more conceptual. Atomic Red Team is a GitHub page with uh, code implementing all the different uh, attack techniques of MITRE, so this is also very useful. And threat intelligence reports, such as the DFIR report that I highly recommend uh, reading, and uh, CISA's, CISA's Stop Ransomware, where they analyze different APT campaigns uh, and, and attacks from the perspective of what um, tools and techniques were used in, in them so that we uh, can understand the IOCs, the, indi the indicators of compromise of these tools, uh, of these attacks. Now, we looked across all of these and we came up with some systematical method with which uh, we can count techniques uh, and count, um, the, yeah, mainly techniques that were used in those attacks, and we can score them, and we can understand what's the most popular uh, or most common attack possible. Uh, and the most common attack possible, oh, I, I, sorry, I forgot, also lessons that we learned from our own customers by looking at data uh, from our company, of course. And then we got to this very generic skeleton of what a network attack would look like um, without the complexity that the MITRE attack matrix has because it's two-dimensional. So this is like a single dimension. So first, there should be some kind of initial access, okay? The attacker uh, gets the very initial foothold on patient zero on the network uh, in some way. Then there's ingress tool transfer. Once the attacker is there, they'll uh, try to send to that um, patient zero a couple of tools that will use, be useful for them for their further activities into the network. Discovery to try and understand what other important assets they should um, check out. 
credential dumping, privilege escalation, things that, and lateral movement that all of these together strengthen the attacker's foothold on the network and eventually some sort of impact that may vary. Uh, it can be like uh, encrypting all the data on all the network, uh, but some very popular technique is, uh, or tactic is also exfiltration. And now that you understand this, we got very quickly to the demo time. Uh, first, a couple of disclaimers. Um, so one, there's uh, sometimes a lot of text on the screen. Um, I don't want you to be intimidated by it, and I don't want you to go and try looking for every, every flag uh, on the demo and try to uh, understand what it does, but rather listen to my explanations, and you'll do fine, I promise. Um, a technique that you will see uh, used here uh, a lot, and I'm not even going to mention it, is that sometimes the output of commands that are um, that are sent to the victim is outputted into a text file, and then the text file is is printed instead of just going interactive. Because when using a reverse shell, there are sometimes slight difficulties uh, for doing it. So this was just for convenience. Also. Um, for the sake of simplicity, I skipped a couple of parts and I uh, made some slight uh, shortcuts. I hope you will not notice it, but if you do, uh, don't be bothered by it. I also turned off every kind of uh, defense mechanism that there is just to prove the point of how an attack is carried out from end to end and not um, make this presentation longer than the time slot that I have. I'll introduce the uh, characters of this story. We have Johnny, no H, single N. He's a frustrated employee. He is silently looking for job opportunities. Uh, he has a colleague named Danny. Uh, both of them have computers, uh, work computers. They're behind the same network. And we have Beatrice. She is a hacker, and she happens to be Portuguese, born and raised in Lisbon. And um, she's made uh, some, she's done some social engineering around, and she's found that Johnny is frustrated and looking for a job opportunity, um, even though he doesn't have anything public about it, but uh, she, she's figured it out, and she's going to take advantage of it. So what she does is use her Kali Linux server. This would be the command and control server with which she communicates with, uh, with the, the infected devices. Um, and it's rather simple. She just looks up GitHub shell to use Python because she knows Python. Uh, and she finds hoax shell, uh, a very nice uh, shell, reverse shell that, that's, uh, that, that's publicly available. She runs uh, this on her computer. So here is hoax shell after she's downloaded and ran it. And what the, the state where she's in now is that she's waiting for a client to communicate back with her. Once it happens, she will get a shell on their device. So um, how she would do it? She would send a phishing email. I threw some maybe clues for, for th that this would be the answer. She sends a phishing email to Johnny that's very well crafted. And she, um, we will see it now. So this is Johnny's computer. He gets an email, and he opens it. Curious man. Uh, the email is a job offer, so it's even more attractive for him. He opens it. This is a, a Word document. And this Word document is loaded with a macro. We will touch on it soon. And Johnny is not very much security aware. He's not uh, a cybersecurity uh, specialist like you are. And he enables the content of the document because he wants to see the job offer in its entirety, right? This is a bad mistake. Uh, but lucky Beatrice now, she will get a shell on Johnny's computer. It's important to mention that there are also many other techniques to get initial access. One of them is uh, a CVE from two years ago, Microsoft Folina, that allowed 
arming documents uh, with the ability to execute code the same way that we saw here. Here it was a plain macro that runs a VBScript, that VBScript runs a PowerShell that communicates back to uh, the server of the attacker. Okay, so once Johnny clicked this, um, Beatrice observes that she has a shell on someone's computer. She doesn't know who it is. So she is checking out, like this is the uh, reconnaissance phase. Uh, so she sees that this is Johnny. Okay, she remembers Johnny because she sent him the phishing email. And uh, the host name is PC Johnny. Okay, that's fine. Now Beatrice is a very well organized hacker. So she has a checklist and uh, initial access is checked. Not only is she organized, but she's also um, following the MITRE taxonomy for tactics. So that's um, very nice of her, very well educated. The next thing she's going to do is ingress tool transfer. Um, so that to conduct further activities, she would like Johnny's computer to have some applications there. Some of them are crafted and some are just normal applications that anyone can download um, that will be used by her later. So here we see that uh, she downloads, she's on Johnny's computer and she downloads a PowerShell script that is on her own GitHub page. And this PowerShell script downloads all the tools that she needs and unzips the zipped ones if necessary. And it's not only from her own server that the, these tools are hosted in many different places. Some are just the original uh, places where the applications are stored, okay? Like the original mirrors. Um, so let's see what we have here. So there's um, a defined. This is an Active Directory querying tool. It queries the LDAP service so that it would be used in the future for discovery. Mimikatz, uh, there's many people here who raised their hand, so I believe you know what Mimikatz is. Uh, just in one sentence, Mimikatz is a tool that is helpful for dumping credentials. Let's put it very simple. PS tools, including PS exec, a tool that is used a lot by IT administrators to run remote commands on computers, useful for further activities. Um, evil exe is crafted by her. This is a piece of malware um, that we gave it an indicative name because there was no um, protection mechanisms, as I said. And R clone, that is a tool that's used to interact with cloud services, especially cloud storage services. So if you want to upload or download something to your, say, Dropbox account, you can do it using our clone. This is also a public service. Uh, all of these are called LOLBINs, uh, which stands for living of the land binaries, um, living of, uh, of the land in the sense of these are popular applications, Everybody used them. Here, I kind of, to, um, I, I stretched the definition of living off the land a little bit because she's downloaded them, so they're not, re they, they weren't on the land, uh, but she's going to use also some, um, some applications that are just coming with the operating system, such as Xcopy and uh, NetUse, NetShare, and so on. Uh, but still, these are applications that no, security administrator has any reason to block straight out of the box. So, ingress tool transfer is completed. Next is discovery. Um, discovery is something uh, like, I'm a tourist here in, in Lisbon now, uh, so I just arrived in, in Lisbon, and the moment I land, I want to orient myself. I want to understand uh, which is the best um, app for uh, Uber or Bolt, and I want to understand where uh, the best ramen is, everyone and his own needs, um, and uh, like places where the Congress Hall is, et, et cetera. And uh, attackers need to do the same. So she's just landed on Johnny's network. She wants to orient herself. She wants to know uh, which 
privileged users uh, there are on the network, which computers and so on, and this is what we're going to see her doing now. Uh, so here she's using Adefine that she's just downloaded onto Johnny's computer. Uh, and she runs a command that shows all the computers on the domain. As said, the technique is outputting into a text file and then printing it. But everything you see here is running commands on Johnny's computer. Uh, and there are three important devices. One of them is the DC, uh, so that she knows that it, it's an, an administra uh, administered network. Uh, Johnny and Danny, that you remember from the introduction, this is Johnny's colleague. Um, okay, noted. Next thing she's going to do is to look for privileged users and uh, user groups to see uh, where the jackpots are. So she runs a net group, and this is uh, a pure living off the land activity because net group is available for everyone who has Windows. Um, and she sees the domain admins group. Very nice and very interesting, and she, uh, I hope, will make her best efforts to take a hold of a user in the domain admins group, because then it would allow her navigate freely across the network. Okay. So discovery is checked. Um, she's found Danny's PC and <clears throat> the domain controller, a couple of users, and she goes on to her next challenge, that's credential dumping and privilege escalation. Okay, um, why would anyone want to do credential dumping? Uh, she already has access to Johnny's computer, so why, why move forward from here? Uh, there's a couple of reasons for this, but the main one is that she wants, um, like two ones, that she wants a better foothold and to um, be able to navigate towards what's interesting on that network. And probably Johnny, a frustrated employee's computer is not that much interesting. Maybe it is, but not in this case. I know because I made the presentation. Um, so what she's going to do for credential dumping is... Come on, you, you, you all raised your hands when it was the time for to say it. Mimikatz, correct. Um, so she's going to use Mimikatz that was already uh, downloaded onto Johnny's computer. She will run it, uh, and let's see her doing this. Mm, this is uh, Mimikatz being run. And uh, what she's doing here is to query the SAM cache. So the, um, to, to look for accounts that were recently logged into the network, uh, like not the network, but Johnny's computer, and then she can get the hashes of the passwords of all those users. Interesting to see that Danny has recently logged into Johnny's computer with his credentials. So she takes his NTLM hash, uh, and she has his hashed password. Now she wants to break that password, uh, so she copies this password into her own computer, uh, runs John the Reaper, which is a, a tool that, again, is very popular among attackers. Uh, it's been around for years, and she's going to see if she can retrieve from the hashed password a plain text password. Um, there are different ways in which John the Ripper does that. Like, theoretically, it wouldn't be possible to uh, go from a hash password to, to, to a clear text one, right? But there are ways to do it, and this is why I'm going to ask your permission to um, wave hands. Um, but you will see how she runs John the Ripper with an input of the hash password, and then she gets the clear text password. That happens to be Kato 2023. Um, so this means that what she can do now, having Danny's password, uh, hop onto Danny's computer, okay? 
um, and maybe uh, treasure hunt for something on Danny's computer. So, oh, but first, check the list, very well organized. Uh, so she has Danny's passport, perfect. Next thing is lateral movement. Um, why would she want to move laterally to uh, Johnny's, uh, to Danny's computer? As we said, the connection that she has now is extremely fragile because if Johnny, um, Johnny's connect goes offline in some way, restarts his computer, I don't know, moving from network to network or anything, then she loses her only uh, way to access that network. So she doesn't want to remain in that fragile state. And this is why it's good for her to make sure that she has different ways of accessing that same network. And we will see this soon. Um, she, she's also interested, you know, if, if there's anything uh, on, on, that Danny knows that jo Johnny doesn't or that his computer knows, it, it would be great for her. Um, so what she does here is uh, enter all the credentials of Danny into uh, some variables on the shell, and then she runs psexec. As said, this is a tool that is used to run um, remote commands uh, on Danny's computer, and that psexec is supposed to create a directory uh, that's uh, c slash exploit on Danny's computer. Okay? Um, again, this runs on Johnny's computer, but it runs remotely on Danny's. Uh, then on Danny's computer, she makes that c slash exploit directory uh, available for sharing with permissions for everyone. Um, and then she maps the drive z from Johnny's computer to uh, Danny's newly created um, directory. Does this make sense? Uh, are you keeping uh, track? Yeah, okay. Um, but would this allow her? You can say it out loud. Why do this? Um, so she can transfer the tools that she had on Johnny's computer to Danny's computer, okay? Because she also wants Danny to, to run some of the, those tools. And particularly, she wants uh, evil exit to be run. We will see, see it soon. So uh, she uses now a living of the land tool, xcopy, to copy evil exit from Johnny, Johnny's to Danny's computer. Evil exe is a piece of malware that she's crafted, and it can, in this case, it's an executable, but of course, there are other ways to um, execute code on computers, like DLL injection and other things that you can read about everywhere. So this file was copied. It's now on Danny's C slash exploit, and now she runs this. This is a scheduled task. The reason that she would want it to be a scheduled task is um, persistence. Okay, why? Because, as said, she, she doesn't want the same fragility that, is it a word? That she had on Johnny's computer to be present now in Danny's computer. So this is why now she, she's smarter. She learned from her mistakes or her... Uh, fragile uh, activities, and now she runs it as a scheduled task so that it's, it remains there, and evil.exe will be run over and over again every time, um, like every X minutes, um, so that in case that even if Danny turns off his computer and then turns it on, um, the scheduled task will remain running, and evil.exe will go back there and she will have persistence on the network. Perfect. Next thing she's going to do, um, now that she has uh, a way to run code on, on Danny's computer, is to copy Mimikatz as well, as you see here, X copy. And um, then by using Mimikatz, she, she runs it on Danny's computer and looks for users that were recently logged into Danny's computer and let's see what she's going to find. 
Oh, by the way, back to the schedule tasks. Uh, schedule task is um, something that was very uh, that is also very popular among different uh, APTs that we analyzed. One of them uh, was not an APT, but a part of MITRE Ingenuity, where they uh, make uh, some example uh, attack tests. Uh, they called it Turla after the Russian attack group, and we, we saw it there as well, obviously. Wow, I can't believe what she's found. When, while we were speaking about other things and waiting for Mimikatz to run, we see that uh, there is an administrator that was recently logged on to Danny's computer. This is perfect, um, because now she's going to do some things that I will not show because I don't want to repeat myself, but she will break the hash of the administrator, get the clear text password of the administrator, and then jackpot. She's like able to, to move freely to wherever she wants on the network. Um, but first, time to check the box. Okay, so now for the exfiltration part, I will um, skip the uh, traveling around that Beatrice has made once she's got the administrator password, and I will tell you that she's found something interesting. A file called sensitivedata.txt, if I remember correctly, and this file um, contains, guess what? And she wants to exfiltrate it, and there are different ways with which she can exfiltrate, okay? Uh, so ideally she would copy it to Johnny's computer and then collect it somehow. She can either print it and then copy paste using her shell, but eh, that, that's like, it, it doesn't make sense and maybe the file is too big so, so you can't really control it. Uh, she can send it over SSH or FTP uh, to her own server, but maybe, and now I'm going to bring the uh, security back in, but maybe there is some sort of filtering of the servers with which the, uh, the, the, they communicate, okay? So that she cannot send just freely any FTP outbound uh, because of the firewall rules that were set by the IT admin of Johnny and Danny. So what she does here to remain as stealthy as possible, and this is something that we also saw on uh, attacks, both that were reported in reports and with my own eyes I saw like uh, attacks happening where attackers use our clone that as said, this is a client that interacts with cloud s storage services, upload to mega.io. Have you heard of mega.io? It's like a, a, a cloud service. It's like a Google Drive, but super fishy. And uh, I, I actually, uh, I've searched the Kato's data and I haven't found a single legitimate use of mega.io, but uh, still like it's, it's, apparently it's, it's legitimate. Like it, it, I, I don't know why uh, this is uh, what only attackers choose to use. Um, so the next is exfiltration of that sensitive file. So in a similar technique to the one that we already saw, she um, has a, a map drive W that's straight to the uh, server that hosts the sensitive data information. She copies it into Johnny's computer, uh, seed slash exploit on Johnny's computer, and uh, now she selects the file and runs our clone that's like command line based to upload it to her own mega account. Obviously it has to be her own because otherwise she wouldn't be able to, to access it unless she attacks someone else. <clears throat> and now the exfiltration is done. All that she has to do now is just to go to that mega um, uh, place. So this is her own computer. Uh, she can do it not only from her Kali Linux, uh, and then she collects the file that was uploaded. It's waiting there for her. And then she sees that it's a database, database with a lot of sensitive data. Mission accomplished. Great success, and I think it's time, not yet, now for a round of applause to Beatrice.
Very well done. Um, OK. Now let's discuss a couple of things that we saw uh, during this attack. Uh, if you have any questions, like quick ones, about the, the way that this attack was carried out, you, you can do it now. Are there any? OK, so we will move forward. Um, if we're looking not only from the tactic point of view, but also from the technique point of view, and this is the attack metrics for those of you who uh, raised their hands uh, before, we can see that Beatrice has stepped on many different techniques, right? And obviously, if you map every APT or every uh, complex um, network attack, you'll see something that's similar to this. Um, yeah, all of them were, were involved. And from here, we will take a couple of takeaways, and there will be some mitigation strategies that are not written here, but I will uh, explain them. Um, so this is not something that we saw directly, but it would be easy to understand this. Tricking the endpoint is relatively easy, whereas tricking a network footprint is not that easy. And I'll explain. Here she used like very um, non-stealthy ways to, to download things. But uh, let's take, for example, the Mimikatz executable. Let's say if she had an anti-malware service that catches the hash of the file Mimikatz and, uh, and quarantines it. She, uh, she could just make some change either the name, this is the easiest, but it wouldn't be enough probably, uh, but also the uh, binary structure obfuscated. There are like tools to, to do it very easily. And then Mimikatz would have a different hash. Um, or maybe she could even do some anti-malware tampering and turn off the anti-malware service completely if she's on the endpoint. However, if you take um, NetUse, NetShare, PSExec, these are commands, specifically the, the living of the land commands are those that you can't fake their network traffic. And the mitigation strategy that we learned from here is that endpoint protection is not always, like, is never enough. Uh, you need a combination of network protection, or of endpoint protection with network protection. Okay, um, network protection products could be like the easiest way to, to mention it. it. It would be some sort of an IPS, okay? Um, and the combination of them would, would allow better detection. We also saw that tools that attackers used are not malicious by definition. And I think that this means that IT administrators or security administrators shouldn't only monitor those clear malware uh, files, but also files that are used uh, for highly privileged users and not allow anyone on the network to use it. Um, let's say, yeah, PSExec, for example, or ADefined. There's no reason that uh, non-IT admin would use these tools unless he is a security researcher, which I'm always fighting with my CISO. Please give access to my um, to my team to run these tools uh, because luckily they do control it. But uh, yeah, but there's no reason for Johnny and Danny to use these tools. Um, obviously, also network segmentation is key because you don't want to provide similar privileges to anyone. You want to see what's going on the network, maybe Johnny and Danny work in different departments and there's no reason even for them to have shared folders between them. So this is also, or to have any kind of uh, SMB or RPC communication between them. This is something that you can control with a very plain, simple firewall and uh, should do it if you're protecting a network. Uh, the more you see, the better you can defend, obviously. And um, total pawning takes multiple steps. I will uh, I will stay here uh, for for a little bit. Uh, it's said that like that that defenders need to be right all the time, and an attacker needs to be right only once. 
right? Uh, have you counted the times where, uh, that Beatrice had to be right? There were many of them, okay? Like, uh, to really take over a network or exfiltrate sensitive data, the attacker needs to carry out multiple steps and to be right many times. Uh, and what we learn from this as defenders is that uh, a defense in-depth approach is crucial when, you, uh, when you're when you trying to, to defend a network. Um, so I'm going to start and try and count the places where def defense would help here. Um, user access control, not through download um, documents that include macros, or if downloaded, not to run them. Um, then, uh, oh, maybe even before that, anti-phishing. Like if the email was better filtered, it, it would help. If there was uh, uh, control over communication with unknown servers such as Beatrice's Kali Linux, it would help. Uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, so um, this means that the better you have a, a defense in-depth approach, uh, the better security you'll get, obviously. And I think that this is it. This is it. Um, yeah, I'll take questions if you have any. Sure, thank you.